Haga click. Oh, my system is saying that it's recording. All right. So, por favor, haga clic en el icono interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla. So, welcome to all our members and supporters from different regions in the world. A world that is deeply troubled by devastation and by inhumanity of the war and violent conflicts in the world. And in particular, the nuclear threats posed by the war in Ukraine. And in our meeting today, after a word of welcome by our co-president, Bishop Stanger, we will be listening to our key speaker and guest, after which there will be a possibility to ask some questions. And after that, we will proceed to a more action-focused session, where we will propose some concrete actions in which you or your organization can take part with the purpose of urging your government to attend that really important meeting in Vienna that is going to take place at the end of June, the first meeting of states parties to the new treaty on the pro prohibition of nuclear weapons. And we will end with a prayer from our co-president, Sister Wamuyu. So before giving the floor to our key speaker, Archbishop Wester, welcome uh, Archbishop. I would like to invite Bishop um, Marc Stanger, who is our co-president of Pax Christi International, uh, to open the meeting. Donc, uh, bonjour Marc, uh, je bonjour. vous donne la parole. Bonjour à tout le monde. Je salue chaleureusement les participants à ce webinaire. L'actualité peut expliquer que nous soyons aussi nombreux. Tout ce qu'on qu entend dans la bouche de responsables, tout ce dont nous sommes témoins comme conséquence d'une culture de guerre, au-delà de toute raison, suscite des inquiétudes. Quant aux suites, quant aux conséquences d'une idéologie rampante qui envahit tous les esprits. En fait, ce à quoi on assiste aujourd'hui, c'est la mise à mal, et on pourrait s'en féliciter, de la théorie de la dissuasion nucléaire. J'ai été amené à discuter avec de nombreuses personnes travaillant dans la production et la recherche nucléaire, des militaires, des diplomates, des gouvernants. Ce qui m'a toujours frappé, c'est qu'ils étaient sincèrement convaincus qu'ils travaillaient à protéger la paix, à garantir la paix et la sécurité de leurs compatriotes. À cela, on ne croit plus depuis que M. Poutine a précipité le monde dans la nuit de l'apocalypse. Les conséquences de la possession de l'armement nucléaire sont moralement inadmissibles parce qu'elles développent une forme de peur, de chantage, de menace qui réduit l'homme au rang de créature inférieure et l'empêche d'assumer pleinement sa responsabilité d'assurer la vie et le développement de ses semblables. Je me réjouis que Pax Christi favorise l'échange à ce sujet avec ceux qui nous ont rejoints aujourd'hui. Convaincu que nous n'avons pas à défendre seulement une morale de croyant, mais une morale profondément humaniste qui met l'homme au centre de tout. Nous sommes requis de construire de nouvelles relations entre les peuples. Nous les construirons ensemble avec ceux qui croient au Dieu d'amour et de pardon, qui en toutes circonstances veut protéger le monde qu'il a créé. Le traité de la prohibition des armes nucléaires entrera en vigueur le 22 janvier 2021, après que 50 
état les signer. Il ne prendra, il ne prendra sens qu'après la, que la communauté internationale dans sa grande extension ne les signer à son tour. C'est alors qu'on assurera un avenir à la communauté, communauté humaine. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monseigneur Stanger. Thank you very much for these inspiring opening words. I would like now to welcome our to welcome Archbishop Esther, who is the Archbishop of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the United States. Archbishop Wester has to a letter, which is called Living in the Light of Christ Peace, a we conversation go. towards uh, nuclear disarmament. Yes, uh, and the urgent need for nuclear disarmament was released in January of this year and could not be more timely. The Archdiocese of Santa Fe has a special role to play in advocating for nuclear disarmament, as it is the site where nuclear weapons were first tested. Two nuclear weapons laboratories and the United States' largest repository of nuclear warheads are still located within the boundaries of the diocese. Archbishop Wester's statement on the war in Ukraine, nuclear weapons must be eliminated, not reinforced, is also very important at this critical time. So, Monsignor Wester, I, I give you the floor, and may I ask you to unmute your, your mic? Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm, I'm most grateful to you all and to Pax Christi International, uh, to Marie Dennis, who's been so gracious to me and hospitable and, and uh, getting me uh, all that I needed to be here with you all. Uh, Bishop uh, Stenger, Stenger, thank you so much for your very uh, important words and uh, all of each and every one of you. I'm so honored to be with you today and thank you for your invitation. Um, I am uh, humbled to be here as the Archbishop of Santa Fe in New Mexico, United States of America, just north of Mexico. Uh, we have a rich history here, deep roots of many cultures, religions, countries of origin. It's a beautiful land where I live. It's a high desert, a land of enchantment, as we call it here, where sky and earth come together for spectacular views. We have strong ecumenical and interfaith relations and a deep respect, particularly for our Native American peoples whose traditions and culture enrich all of us. It is also the birthplace of the atomic bomb. Los Alamos National Laboratories and Sandia National Laboratories uh, are here in my archdiocese, uh, probably here in Albuquerque where I live for part of the week and Santa Fe the rest of the week, but in Albuquerque, most likely we have the largest concentration of nuclear armaments than in any other place in the world. I must admit to you all that when I first came to Santa Fe in 2015, I did not think too much of nuclear arms. Perhaps like many in our world, I had been lulled into a false sense of complacency and uh, didn't think of the laboratories or nuclear weapons or the billions and billions of dollars spent each year by our government to research, develop, and maintain our current stockpile and to create even more powerful and sophisticated nuclear weapons. But then in 2017, several bishops and I visited Japan. We were basically on vacation, but we took time out of our vacation for a more serious visit to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I can still remember uh, my feelings at the time when we visited the museums and the various displays, taking in the terrible, terrible human suffering that those two bombs created in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In particular, I was moved to read about the school children who were attracted to the light of the explosion and ran to the window to see what it was. How tragic for them. For us in the Christian tradition, Christ is the light of the world, the light that pierces the darkness. That light in 1945 was obscene and anything but life-giving. When I returned to Santa Fe, I felt a certain uneasiness 
the full name of Santa Fe is La Villa Real de la Santa Fe de San Francisco de Assis, the royal town of the holy faith of St. Francis of Assisi. Our city is known for peace. St. Francis, of course, made famous his peace prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Sometime after returning from Japan, I took some friends to the New Mexico History Museum. And as part of that museum, there is a display of the Manhattan Project, the main production of which took place in the Los Alamos laboratories. Far, it gave me a far different perspective having come just from Japan. I saw a connection between Santa Fe, the city of peace, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But it was a disturbing connection, a troubling connection, an uneasy connection. I remember my own childhood when I was 12 years old in San Francisco, California, in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, looking up in the air, coming home from school and seeing airplanes and wondering if they were Russian airplanes, if we were being attacked. I felt afraid, but I was much more fortunate than those children in Nagasaki and in Hiroshima in 1945. And now here we are in 2022 with the start of this unjust war of aggression being forced upon Ukraine and Putin rattling his nuclear saber. That fear that I felt in 1962 once again, again came back to me ever more real 60 years later. It is clearly evident to all of us that nuclear weapons are an immediate, direct, and absolute obstacle to world peace. They symbolize the antithesis of the right relationships we're called to have with one another as individuals and as countries. They carry within them the potential to destroy our relationships with each other, indeed to destroy all of creation. They are fully capable of completely destroying our common home, Mother Earth. All major religions and all people of goodwill call us to live in right relationships with one another. Our Hebrew and Christian scriptures see this thread woven throughout to be in right relationship with God and right relationship with one another. A favorite author of mine, Father Walter Burkhardt of Happy Memory puts it well. He states that God whom we attempt to describe as a community of persons has created us in God's own image and likeness. That is that you and I are communal, we're relational by our very nature. And those who think otherwise, Father Burkhardt says, do violence to scripture. He says, and I quote, those who read in the sacred text a surely personal individualistic morality have not understood the Torah, have not sung the Psalms, have not been burned by the prophets, have not perceived the implications and the very burden of Jesus's message and must inevitably play fast and loose with St. Paul. The social focus of God's book is evident on the first page. The song of creation is our overture. Our incredibly imaginative God did not have in mind isolated units, autonomous entities. God had in mind a people, a human family, a community of persons, a body genuinely one. Nuclear weapons threaten the very fabric of these relationships God intends for us to have. We even traditionally speak of nuclear arms as existing in silos. They would certainly force us human beings into silos, fragmenting and even destroying the very life we hold sacred and relational. There are many, many reasons to fight for the abolition of nuclear weapons in our world. You know them all very well better than I. You have taught me about them, and they appear in my pastoral letter, Living in the Light of Christ's Peace, a conversation toward nuclear disarmament. My plea, and that of so many of us pastors, is to abolish nuclear weapons because they are diametrically opposed to God's plan of creation, a creation God called good. They make right relationships impossible. They are the swords that Christ himself commanded to be put back, to be put back in their sheaths, never to be used, and hopefully one day never to exist. For us Catholics, our universal pastor, Pope Francis, has created a seismic shift 
in the moral landscape that for decades has advocated for the abolition of nuclear arms, but at the same time allowed them for deterrence. Bishop Stenger uh, made reference to this just a few minutes ago. Even the United States Bishop's Peace Pastoral of 1983 allowed for nuclear arms intended for deterrence. I think it sh I should note here that in fact, the two major nuclear powers, despite the narratives projected, have never kept nuclear stockpiles merely for deterrence. Mr. Jay Coglin, the executive director of Nuclear Watch New Mexico, is extremely persuasive when he argues that both the United States and Russia have never been committed only to deterrence. Rather, they have detailed plans for first strike capabilities and nuclear war fighting. If it were only deterrence that mattered, then each would have only a small number, say one or 200 nuclear arms. As it is, the United States, as we know, has 5,500 and Russia has 6,257, according to the Arms Control Association. But deterrence or not, Pope Francis has moved the moral needle. On the 75th anniversary of the nuclear attack on Hiroshima, August 6, 2020, Pope Francis repeated what he said on November 24, 2019, at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. The use of atomic energy for purposes of war is immoral, just as the possessing of nuclear weapons is immoral. Pope St. John XXIII, Pope St. Paul VI, Pope St. John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis have all spoken against nuclear arms. And now Pope Francis has closed the moral door on even their possession. As we know for centuries, we Christians have maintained what is called the just war theory. Nuclear weapons make such a theory absolutely impossible. For us, this moral imperative of nuclear disarmament is rooted in the gospel and in Jesus Christ's clear affirmation of peace and nonviolence. Often, historically, we've hedged our bets. We've sought to somehow clear a path for a just war, but nuclear armaments make that completely impossible. For example, one of the war, just war components is that war can only be fought if there's a reasonable chance of success, but destroying the planet does not allow for success. Furthermore, the components states that deaths and injuries incurred in a hopeless clause are not morally justifiable. Destroying the planet is the ultimate hopeless cause. Another component of the just war theory is that it is to reestablish peace, a just war is. But again, how is it possible to reestablish peace after Armageddon? Yet another component of the just war theory is that violence must be proportionate to the injury suffered. Clearly, thermonuclear war is never proportionate. And finally, the weapons used in war must discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. Civilians are never permissible targets of war and every effort must be taken to avoid killing civilians. Nothing more needs to be said. And Ukraine is certainly a tragic example of this. Another trenchant argument for nuclear disarmament from a gospel perspective is the money that's used to develop, manufacture and improve nuclear arms. As President Eisenhower famously said, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world is in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. In 2019, Pope Francis declared, here in this city of Nagasaki, which witnessed the catastrophic humanitarian and environmental consequences of a nuclear attack, our attempts to speak out against the arms race will never be enough. The arms race wastes precious resources that could be better used to benefit the integral development of peoples and to protect the natural environment. In a world where millions of children and families live in inhumane conditions, 
the money that is squandered and the fortunes made through the manufacture, upgrading, maintenance, and sale of ever more destructive weapons are an affront that crying out to heaven. For us in the Christian tradition, the gospel of nonviolence and peace demands that we move beyond war. Those who are non-Catholic and non-Christian and often embrace the teachings that we do as well. We come together as a people and understand that Jesus proclaimed a gospel of nonviolence. Our Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. spoke eloquently about the gospel of nonviolence. Loving our enemies, it sounds idealistic, but Martin Luther King said that Jesus was not an impractical idealist. He was the practical realist. When the disciples wanted to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans who would not receive Jesus, he rebuked them sternly. When approaching Jerusalem and his death, Jesus breaks down crying and says, if today you had only understood the things that make for peace. In front of his accusers, our Lord remains silent as a lamb to the slaughter and even forgiveness to his executioners. Not just internal conversion, but also advocate protests, influence and work towards peace or nuclear arm disarmament. We're not talking about complete pacifism. Peace is hard work. It must engage, we must engage the process and even put our life on the line, believing that Jesus is truly a peacemaker and his followers are called to do the same, as we are called to seek a verifiable, multilateral, complete nuclear disarmament in our world. In my pastoral letter, I expressed the hope to rejuvenate, to sustain and amplify a conversation about nuclear disarmament. This is urgent. The present state of the world is shouting out to us about this urgency. In late February of this year, when President Putin talked about putting his nuclear arsenal on alert, a chill went up my spine. I remembered what I felt like in 1962 at the age of 12. Meetings such as the one we're having right now are essential to keeping the conversation going. I applaud you for your efforts and I look forward to working with you in the future in any way that we can in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe to promote this conversation and to achieve eventual nuclear disarmament and a world devoted to peace. We must ask ourselves, what am I doing today to make this world a more peaceful place? It may be a prayer for peace, a calling a friend and talking about the need for nuclear disarmament folding this cause into a sermon, writing legislators, studying the issue on nuclear disarmament, joining groups such as Pax Christi and other groups as Nuclear Watch New Mexico, pulling money out of investments that support nuclear weapons and war making in general, to follow the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, to find a way to support the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. These are all some of the ways that we can work toward peace and verifiable nuclear disarmament in our world. The situation in Ukraine only underscores the urgency of our conversation. Yesterday or the day before, many of us bishops had the opportunity to talk to the His Beatitude in Ukraine, who was the head of the, of the Catholic uh, Church there. And he described for us the horrors of war. Nuclear weapons even exacerbate these horrors even more. If that's, they are holding our world hostage right now, even by threatening their use. They are destructive, just sitting silently in their silos. As I wrote after the outbreak of war in Ukraine, as to the general legitimacy of nuclear weapons, I ask people to recall the ex-Defense ex Secretary, Robert McNamara, who observed that only by luck did humanity survive the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis? Moreover, since that time, there have been a number of false alerts that came close to triggering nuclear Armageddon. In addition, we now are aware of potential nuclear winter that could kill billions through starvation. Simply put, there is nothing legitimate about genocidal weapons of mass destruction. On top of this, today's nuclear arms race is arguably even more dangerous than the first because of new cyber warfare techniques, 
hypersonic delivery platforms, and artificial intelligence. We cannot count on humanity's luck to hold out, especially when possibly unhinged or ruthless leaders make irresponsible statements like other countries could face consequences they have never seen or fire and fury like the world has never known. I am living in the heart of the United States nuclear weapons complex, which is now spearheading a $1.7 trillion program to modernize nuclear weapons and their delivery systems with new military capabilities. A system for keeping nuclear weapons forever is not what the world needs. The national labs within my archdiocese should instead be diligently working on the technical underpinnings for future world free of nuclear weapons, including advanced warhead detection and monitoring and international accounting of nuclear weapons materials. As a provisional step toward global nuclear disarmament mandated by the 1970 Non-Proliferation Treaty, the United States and Russia, which together possess more than 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, should bilaterally decrease their stockpiles to the few hundred needed for just deterrence, instead of the thousands they employ for nuclear war fighting. From there, the international community should work diligently towards complete, universal, verifiable nuclear disarmament. Pope Francis declared, we must never grow weary of working to support the principal international legal instruments of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, including the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. As I wrote in my pastoral letter, it is not enough that we become instruments of peace, as important as that is. No, we must take up the cause of worldwide nuclear disarmament with an urgency that befits the seriousness of this cause and the dangerous threat that looms over all humanity and the planet. We pray for an end to war, an end to atrocities. We pray for a future world free of nuclear weapons. But prayers are not enough. The Russian invasion of Ukraine should end without delay. Freedom loving peoples everywhere should pressure their politicians to halt the new nuclear arms race and take concrete steps toward verifiable global nuclear disarmaments. Humanity's very existence is at stake. I was on the Nuclear Watch New Mexico website the other day, and I saw a very interesting quote, which I've never seen before, by General Omar Bradley, who was our first uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, Chief. Uh, he said, ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. We know more about war than we do about peace, more about killing than we know about living. We have grasped the mystery of the atom and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. Pope Francis is giving witness to the Sermon on the Mount, to nuclear disarmament and to peace. In his Irby at Orby speech this past Easter, he quoted the Russell Einstein Manifesto, here then is the problem which we present to you, stark and dreadful and inescapable. Shall we put an end to the human race or shall mankind renounce war? My sisters and brothers, may our meeting today and so many like it be one of many that leads us to renounce war. May there be peace in Ukraine. May there be peace everywhere. But by the grace of God, peace will break out only if we work assiduously for it. I am honored to be part of that effort and proud to join all of you at Pax Christi International as together we work for peace and nuclear disarmament. May God bless you and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monsignor Wester. You have given us a lot of, a lot of food for thought and for reflection and also challenging us for action. And I think we can build further on that in the course of this, this webinar. And we have now invited three different um, resource persons who might give us also some further food for thought. And we're starting with Père Michel or I can also say Michaelo Dimit. He's Archbishop, Archpriest, excuse me, of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. 
Professor of Eastern Canon Law, Ecclesiology, Public Theology and Theology of Maidan at the Ukrainian Catholic University of Lviv. Père Michel, uh, je vous donne la parole. Merci. Bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, je voudrais en premier lieu remercier Christian Internationalis pour le travail constant que l'organisme fait pour la paix sans l'utilisation d'armes de mort dans le monde. Je vous remercie aussi pour l'honneur de pouvoir vous parler. Malheureusement, comme l'actualité nous le démontre, il existe une autre philosophie qui parle aussi de paix qu'elle veut instaurer par le biais des armes de destruction massive. Dans ce contexte, la question que pose l'archevêque Wester, devrions-nous travailler au désarmement nucléaire, est de première importance. Oui, même si nous ne sommes pas toujours assez sur le thème du désarmement nucléaire. En parlant de l'Ukraine, je voudrais commencer par la constatation suivante. Les paroles du pape François de 2019 à Hiroshima sur le fait que la possession d'armes nucléaires est immorale semble être le sentiment des auteurs de la déclaration sur la souveraineté d'État de l'Ukraine écrite en 1990, où ils écrivaient que l'Ukraine adhère à trois principes non nucléaires, ne pas accepter, ne pas produire et ne pas acquérir des armes nucléaires. Dans cette logique, avant juin 1992, toutes les têtes nucléaires tactiques ont été exportées en Russie. Et suite au mémorandum de Budapest de 1994, les missiles balistiques intercontinentaux, les bombardiers stratégiques et les ogives nucléaires stratégiques ont été démantelés ou détruits avant juin 1996. La question qui se pose aujourd'hui est, quelles sont les conséquences d'une telle démarche de l'Ukraine de devenir un État dénucléarisé En premier lieu, il faut dire que la promesse de devenir dénucléarisé était d'une importance capitale pour l'indépendance. C'était comme un billet pour l'Ukraine vers la reconnaissance internationale de son statut d'État. Le deuxième point est qu'avec le débarrassement de l'arme nucléaire, l'Ukraine est s'est détaché de la Russie sur le plan de sa défense, mais aussi politiquement et économiquement. Le problème du mémorandum de Budapest est dans la solidité et le sérieux des pays garants de l'intégrité territoriale de l'Ukraine. Par exemple, le texte anglais parlait d'assurance et le texte russe de garantie. Comme nous en sommes témoins de nos jours, la Russie de garant est devenue envahisseur. Et les États-Unis et la Grande-Bretagne ont pris beaucoup de temps précieux pour la vie de beaucoup de personnes pour œuvrer en vue de la préservation de la souveraineté de l'Ukraine. Enfin, quelle est donc la conclusion Volodymyr Zelensky, le président de l'Ukraine, lors de la conférence de Munich sur la, sur la sécurité qui s'est déroulée le 19 février 2022, a rappelé que depuis 2014, l'Ukraine a tenté à trois reprises, mais sans aucun succès, de convoquer les consultations avec les États garants du mémorandum de Budapest. Dans le cas de l'Ukraine, il faut donc impérativement que soient instaurés des mécanismes de décision concrète pour assurer la sécurité de ce pays, car comme on le voit, le mémorandum de Budapest n'a pas aidé à la paix et la bonne volonté de l'Ukraine pour la liquidation totale de son arsenal d'armes nucléaires a été un peu trahie. L'élaboration d'un tel mécanisme est très important pour le futur, car il pouvait, il pourrait, s'il pouvait prouver par son efficacité sur un terrain de guerre, cela pourrait aider d'autres pays dans le futur à opter pour la dénucléarisation. Voici un témoignage ukrainien sur le bien fondé du travail au désarmement nucléaire dans le monde, car il ne s'agit pas seulement d'une question technique de sécurité, mais d'une question de civilisation. 
Merci. Thank you very much, Father Michel. Thank you very much. We will later on uh, offer the possibilities of the participants to ask questions if they wish to. Um, I would like now to invite our second speaker, which is Mr. Caleb Benchir, who's president of the Fondation de l'Islam de France, which was created in 2016 from the desire to consolidate national harmony in France and contributing to the construction of an Islam of France anchored in French society in its principles and its values. Mr. Benchir is also president of the World Conference of Religions for Peace France, and I would like to invite him to take the floor. Thank you. No. We didn't, don't seem to hear you. Et maintenant? Super. Merci. Oui, ça marche. Thank you. <rire> Merci bien. J'étais en train de dire, je vous écoute en anglais et je réponds en français comme citoyen français. Merci pour tout ce que vous dites et je voudrais vous dire mon respect et mon amitié. Euh, ces questions de, de désarmement ne sont pas qu'une question de morale, même si les armements nucléaires relève de tout ce qui est attentatoire à, à l'humanité et tout ce qui est anti-humaniste. Et ce n'est pas qu'une affaire de croyants. J'y reviendrai. C'est une affaire d'hommes et de femmes de bonne volonté et ceux qui ont l'amour du genre humain gravé en eux et dans leur cœur. Ce que je voudrais dire, c'est il y a deux thèses de tout temps concurrentes. Il y a une première thèse qui souligne et soutient que depuis les guerres puniques ou les guerres médiques jusqu'à l'Ukraine maintenant, il y a une course effrénée entre la cuirasse et l'épée. Et quoi que nous fassions, quoi que nous disions, ce sera toujours le cas parce que la violence est intrinsèque, inhérente, organique, structurelle, propre à l'esprit humain, et c'est comme ça que l'homme agit. Et si vis pacem para bellum. Voilà, et ça a toujours été malheureusement appliqué. La preuve, c'est que 13 mois et 2 jours depuis l'entrée en vigueur du traité Contre la, contre, qui rend euh, effective la, juridiquement en tout cas l'abolition, la, la proscription, la prohibition euh, des armes nucléaires, nous avons une guerre euh, contre le peuple ukrainien et une guerre sur notre propre sol européen. Et à ce sujet, je voudrais dire toute ma compassion, mon amitié, ma sympathie, la nôtre d'une manière générale pour le peuple ukrainien et pour tous les peuples qui souffrent de par le monde et injustement chassés de leur demeure à cause de la folie meurtrière, notamment des guerres, des guerres injustes. Il n'y a jamais de guerre juste, il n'y a jamais de guerre sainte, il n'y a jamais de combat sacré. La guerre est maudite, la guerre est une malédiction, la guerre est une dévastation. Il est des cas dits de légitime défense, on en parlera plus tard. Mais l'idée fondamentale, c'est que euh, la civilisation, et je rejoins le père Michel, je, donc je suis au, à la deuxième thèse, à la seconde thèse, c'est qu'on ne règle pas les problèmes, les différents, 
et la divergence entre les hommes par la violence. Et ça, c'est la seconde thèse et à laquelle nous tenons tous. Sinon, nous autres, et à commencer par nos amis et pour lesquels, encore une fois, je dis mon respect de Pax Christi, nous ne sommes là que pour faire rouler le rocher de Sisyphe et parler de paix dans ce contexte-là ne relève que de la naïveté obtuse. Mais nous n'abdiquons pas, nous n'abdiquons pas pour deux raisons. La première, cette fois-ci je le dis comme croyant, aimer Dieu c'est aimer les hommes, adorer Dieu c'est être au service de l'humanité. Être dans une relation au divin, c'est être respectueux et aimant du vicaire de Dieu sur terre qu'est l'homme, récipiendaire du souffle divin et réceptacle de cette effusion de bonté, d'amour et de miséricorde qui émane de lui. Sinon, ce n'est qu'un pur mensonge. Et aussi parce que nous croyons et en dépit de toutes les dérives extrémistes et fanatiques, c'est que tuer un seul homme, c'est tuer l'humanité tout entière. Et sauver une vie humaine, c'est sauver l'humanité tout entière. Ça, c'est le témoignage et le testament de croyants. Mais au-delà de la foi, on a un Dieu un clément et miséricordieux, c'est aussi le bon sens, c'est aussi l'humanisme qui n'est plus théocentré, mais qui est anthropocentré. Parce qu'avec les armes nucléaires, c'est le devenir même de l'humanité qui est plus que menacé, et jamais nous n'avons été aussi proches que ces temps-ci où le, les dirigeants russes parlent de fulgurance d'armes et nous sommes près d'un conflit thermonucléaire. Alors que faire Et notre fondation que fait ben, Elle investit en l'homme, en l'être humain, les hommes et les femmes, parce que nous faisons nôtre la devise de l'UNESCO. C'est dans l'esprit des hommes que naissent les guerres et c'est dans l'esprit des hommes qu'il faut ériger les défenses de la paix. C'est ce que nous croyons fondamentalement. Et encore une fois, et pardon, mon discours n'est pas moralisateur et nous l'avons entendu plusieurs fois, ce qui a été englouti comme argent depuis le 24 février dernier jusqu'à nos jours. Et récemment, j'ai entendu que Joe Biden doit donner encore, et non sans raison, 33 milliards de dollars pour aider le peuple ukrainien à se défendre, eh bien ce qui a été englouti comme argent, qu'est-ce que cela aurait donné en école, en hôpitaux et pour le bien-être des hommes. Donc c'est pour ça que ça devient aussi une question de civilisation, une question de progrès de, de l'esprit humain, quel qu'il soit, et ce pourquoi nous investissons, c'est dans l'éducation des hommes, des êtres humains, hommes et femmes, également fondamentalement égaux, bien entendu, avec la liberté. Reste comment régler les problèmes Bien sûr qu'il faut les régler avec le droit. C'est l'idée que nous nous faisons effectivement de la civilisation et du progrès. Je vous laisse avec une question ancienne, philosophique. Le droit sans la puissance est faible et rien, il ne s'appliquera pas. Et ce n'est pas une raison pour que nous abdiquions, au contraire. Et la puissance sans le droit est, est dévastatrice et nous voyons à quelle injustice cela nous emmène. Est-ce une raison pour baisser les bras et se résigner Non, mille fois non. Au contraire, notre rencontre aujourd'hui contribuera à sensibiliser les esprits. Donc, c'est une préparation patiente, persévérante euh, de modeler l'esprit humain avec la foi pour ceux qui croient et nous croyons aussi à la force de l'amour et de la miséricorde et aussi pour les autres, 
continuer à cheminer comme ça si nous voulons léguer aux générations futures un monde meilleur. Et merci de m'avoir écouté. Thank you very much, Mr. Benchi. Uh, as I said, questions will come later on. I would like now to give the floor to our last speaker, who is Luis Emil Sanabrio Duran from Latin America, Colombia. He is the director of Redepas. It's a civil society network in Colombia committed to building social and economic democracy that allows access to justice without resorting to war. And he's also a member of CLAVI, which is the Latin America Coalition for the Prevention of Armed Violence. So Mr. Stanabri, I will give you the floor and I understood that you would speak Spanish. Sí, buenos días. Qué buena oportunidad de saludar a todos mis amigos de Paz Cristi. Nosotros eh, no podemos escapar de, de hacer un análisis siempre de la situación de Colombia en relación con la guerra y en relación con esta amenaza nuclear. Hoy te, vivimos todavía en, en un país inmerso en un conflicto armado de más de 60 años que invierte el 37% de su Producto Interno Bruto en la guerra. Eso es una cifra más o menos cercana a los 14 mil millones de dólares. Eso es una situación muy grave en uno de los países más empobrecidos del mundo y cuyo presidente, en lugar de respetar la Constitución, que dice que Colombia, eh, en, ante los conflictos internacionales, debe ser un país mediador, ha decidido tomar partido. Y tomar partido no necesariamente a favor del pueblo ucraniano, sino a favor de los poderes, de los bloques de poderes. Eso significa que hace Colombia, un país tan empobrecido, ha sido admitido como un país auxiliar de la OTAN, amigo de la OTAN, miembro de la OTAN por allá en, en un último renglón, pero al fin y al cabo vinculado a uno de los grupos o a uno de los bloques económicos y de la guerra. Colombia, eh, o para nosotros esta situación de esta invasión, de este sometimiento al pueblo ucraniano, es una consecuencia de este modelo económico mundial, de esta forma de eh, generar riqueza que empobrece a millones y millones de seres humanos en el mundo. O sea, la amenaza nuclear no es sino la extensión de la dominación de los países, de los países económicamente pudientes que nos han impuesto la guerra no solamente a Colombia, sino a muchos países en el mundo. El hambre, las hambrunas, la, el empobrecimiento de millones y millones de seres humanos, el refugio que muchos de ellos están siendo sometidos, es parte de la extensión de la misma guerra. Una guerra económica que si la humanidad no la supera, definitivamente vamos a estar sometidos a la extinción, también por lo que se conoce como el fenómeno del calentamiento global. Entonces, este componente, hoy nueva amenaza de, 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 de guerra nuclear para nosotros, es parte de ese, de, de ese ejercicio de dominación y de implementación del miedo. ¿Para qué los países y para qué los pueblos no se liberen del hambre y de la pobreza? Esa situación que hoy impone Rusia y que es respondida igualmente por la OTAN y por los otros bloques económicos, no es una amenaza para el futuro. Es una amenaza ya presente que estamos viviendo, que estamos sufriendo. 
Es un modelo que nos ha impuesto la violencia. La violencia no es innata a los seres humanos. Los seres humanos somos amorosos, solidarios, querendones. Somos hechos a imagen y semejanza de un Dios para la vida. Y por eso defendemos la vida. Y por eso para nosotros eh, la obstinación en la paz, en, el, en la ruta de la no violencia, es el reflejo de un convencimiento de que el ser humano es un ser humano para eh, defender no solamente su vida, sino todas las expresiones de la vida sobre el planeta. Así que, por supuesto que, nos, que rechazamos las amenazas de guerra nuclear, aunque para nosotros y para el pueblo colombiano inmerso en su propia guerra, una guerra no, nuclear la siente como lecana. Tenemos un amigo corresponsal de nuestra organización hoy en Ucrania enviándonos fotografías, eh, enviándonos testimonios de lo que ocurre, de la crueldad de la guerra. Y yo la coloco en mis redes sociales. Y también coloqué ayer en mis redes sociales una situación en la que se vieron envueltos unos niños. Estábamos celebrando el Día de los Niños en Colombia, en una escuela. Y los grupos armados atacaron la escuela, hirieron una niña, hirieron el pro, un, un profesor. Y yo coloqué coincidencialmente las dos, las dos imágenes, una primero la de Ucrania y luego la de, la de Colombia. Y la respuesta la, de la mayoría de los colombianos y colombianas es que, ¿qué nos importa la guerra en Ucrania si aquí estamos viviendo peor? Porque el pueblo no conecta que las guerras son una sola en Europa, en Estados Unidos, en Colombia, en África o en Asia. El modelo de la guerra para imponer pobreza, para saquear los pueblos, para construir inequidad, para acabar con las democracias, es un modelo que la sociedad debe definitivamente superar. Eso implicaría no solamente... Eh, que, que se respeten los tratados, hacen tratados y ellos mismos los irrespetan, porque ellos son los nueve países que, que gobiernan, que deciden, que mandan, y nosotros obedecemos. El día que esta situación cambie y que podamos los pueblos liberarnos de la guerra, liberarnos de un modelo económico neoliberal que empobrece, ese día podemos también con mucha fuerza y desde ya, por supuesto, oponernos a esta amenaza y a este presente de la guerra nuclear que nos somete y nos eh, cunde de miedo y de eh, desesperanza a los pueblos. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanabria. Um, and thank you to the speakers and I think we can now focus uh, maybe for about you know, 15 minutes we can open the floor for questions you may have uh, to one of the speakers uh, to one of the speakers so maybe if you want to ask a question you can put it in the chat or you can show your little yeah. yellow little hand. Yellow hand thank you uh, yes Susan uh, yes Susan Thank you. My name is Susan Gunn. I'm the director of the Marriott Hello. Office for Global Concerns in Washington, D.C. Archbishop Wester, thank you so much uh, for your teaching. I, I put my comment in the chat and I'll just read it here. And for your willingness, thank you, your willingness to meet with us today. And as you can imagine, many of us are, are very aligned with the priorities in your pastoral letter and we were thrilled to receive it and we're doing all we can to share it. Um, my question is, uh, what do you think the next step should be within your diocese and among the your fellow bishops in the United States? Um, I'm sure you're talking with many, many groups in your diocese and your fellow bishops, and, I, and you really have a, a, a clear understanding of, of what the opportunities and challenges are. So what do you want us to focus on for the next step? to happen and how can we um, help you do that? Thank you very much, Susan, for your kind words. And um, 
I think you make a good point to look at next steps. I think for us in the Archdiocese, one of our participants uh, uh, chat in the chat talked today is the Feast of St. Catherine of Siena. And, and when she said, speak the truth in a million voices, it is silence that kills. That came from Carol Gilbert. And I, I think that's really on target. For us in the Archdiocese, we want to end the silence. We've been silent for too long. This Archdiocese has a history of, of, of working for nuclear disarmament and having peace protests, uh, you know, and, and the laboratories and all, and, and in a very respectful and but assertive way. And so I think we need to get back to that. We need to, to give voice to what we're saying here today. And I think the bishops need to do the same thing. Uh, Pope Francis has really, as I said in my pastoral letter, he's moved the, the needle, uh, the moral needle, by saying even possessing nuclear weapons is immoral. So I think that we all need to, to, to really just be very serious about that. And Ukraine is showing us that this is not some kind of uh, old fashioned thinking, but this is very real today. What we're seeing today uh, is just so horrific. So I think we need to speak out. We need to speak to our legislators. I think uh, uh, um, uh, Nuclear Watch New Mexico, nukewatch.org uh, is a great uh, uh, site, a good Google here in New Mexico. It's a wonderful uh, movement and organization. Uh, Jay Coggins is the executive director and to kind of get on nukewatch.org and to, and the pastoral letter, thanks be to goodness, we're having it translated uh, into Korean, uh, Japanese, Spanish. And so I think that's another way of, of, you know, reading the letter and then just lifting up our voice. I think sometimes too many of us think, well, what, what can I do? You know, it's just such a huge issue. And, but I think if we all come together and speak, speak loudly, look at what President Zelensky is doing. His, he's raising his voice courageously and putting his life on the line and he's inspiring uh, you know, the world really. So I think that's a, a, a very good, and I think Susan, you know what you're doing and you're on the Pax Christi International, Pax Christi United States, the different local organizations of Pax Christi. These are all things we have to do to support the, uh, the non-proliferation -pro uh, treaties I can. These are all things I think that we should be giving voice to. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Esther. I see um, Mr. John Hegel. Yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you, Archbishop Wester. Uh, my name is John Hegel. I'm the uh, chair of the Gospel Nonviolence Working Group for the Association of United States Catholic priests and Archbishop Wester is our bishop moderator. Uh, I am also very grateful for your courage and for your pr prophetic pastoral. You mentioned that the church has made a seismic shift from just war to just peace or to a biblical understanding of justice that is the source of peace. But I think it is also leaving a seismic gap, a chasm between where the people of God, the Catholic population, and the bishops are at this time. Uh, I don't have any idea how we're going to leap that gap, but your pastoral challenges it. And I think that one of the questions I guess I have is, how have the other bishops in the country and other leaders, uh, well, not just in the United States, but around the world responded to your prophetic message. Thank you, Father. Thank you. I appreciate your question very much and your uh, Association of U.S. Catholic Priests is a wonderful organization here in the United States. Um, I, I haven't, I, I've, most of the response I've gotten has been very positive. I have heard from Brother Bishops who, who were very pleased with the letter. Um, we have sent the pastoral letter to those, especially to those bishops in the United States anyway, who have uh, nuclear uh, you know, bomb making or uh, components of bombs. They have those kinds of facilities in their dioceses because I think they have a you know, direct uh, voice that's very important. Um, I know there are a lot of things going on in our world today. Uh, again, as I go back, I think there's just been a real, uh, we've been lulled in a false sense of complacency and not, people don't realize that we're in a brand new uh, arms race. And they don't realize the billions and in, in even into the trillions of dollars that are being spent on modernizing our nuclear arsenals. Uh, we have, for example, here in Los Alamos labs, they're working on the PIC cores. 
and there's billions of dollars being given for that. So I think, again, um, I do believe this is an issue that our conference needs to take up and to be very vocal about. Uh, in 1983, when we came out with the Peace Pastoral, we were very bold. That made a huge uh, impact, I believe, on the conversation, uh, the Peace Pastoral 93. And I think that we need to, I, I, would, I would say we need to write a new pastoral. Uh, that one uh, is now obsolete, really, and this has a wonderful work at the time. Uh, my dear friend, Archbishop Quinn, uh, had a lot to do with that, was president of the USCCB then. And I think that there's a lot that we need to, uh, to do now to, to give voice to that. I think, I, I think if we could say, it's hard to say that anything good could come out of the Ukraine war, it's so terrible. But if there was something, if God can write straight with the crooked line, it would be to awaken all of us to the danger of nuclear armaments and that we all of us have to, to speak up against them. And I think too, you know, I think Father, you point to something that, that we don't really say too much out loud. And that is that Jesus Christ uh, preached nonviolence, not just kind of a passivity where you just sit back and, and you know, but, but really a, a, an, a, a, an assertive nonviolence where we work hard, even putting our lives on the line for peace and, and Jesus is very strong in this, but I think we kind of give a wink and a nod to that. We say, yes, but, you know, you have to do this, and yes, but. Uh, I think also what we need to do is follow the money. There's big, big money involved in making nuclear bombs. And this seems to be so true in so many ways, you know, that there's a, we need to be aware of that, and we need to look at how we can convert these laboratories from bomb making to peacemaking. And we'd need a lot of jobs and a lot of technology to ensure verifiable uh, disarmament throughout the world, multilateral disarmament. So I think these are some of the things that we need to kind of really uh, emphasize. But thank you, Father, for your question. Thank you very much. I see, um, meanwhile, my video is gone, but um, I don't think this is a problem. I see that uh, Monseigneur Stanger, vous voulez poser une question, s'il vous plaît? Vous voulez ouvrir votre micro? On ne vous entend pas. Voilà. Merci. C'est pour Monseigneur euh, Western. Euh, merci pour la, sa, la contribution que vous avez, nous avez faite. Je voudrais euh, me rappeler que j'ai participé à une série de réunions de délégations gouvernementales des USA, d'Angleterre, de France et de Russie au Vatican. Nous avons trouvé des gens dans, à ces, dans ces réunions acquis à l'idée de la pertinence de la théorie de, de la dissuasion et nous, nous, accusant, nous accusant, accusant le pape François d'idéalisme et de naïveté. Ma question est, euh, selon Monseigneur Western, quel chemin voit-il pour convertir les responsables à d'autres visions Merci. Oh, thank you. Could you just repeat that last part again, please? The very last part, of the, I didn't catch that. Pardon, pardon, pardon. Monseigneur Stanger, on ne vous entend plus. Et la question était de répéter la dernière phrase. Monsieur okay. Sanger, on ne vous entend pas. Mais, merci. non, on ne vous entend pas. <rire> Qu'est-ce que, qu que je veux euh, euh, Monseigneur Wester a demandé oui, de répéter oui. la dernière partie de votre... De votre... Dans, le, dans les réunions auxquelles j'ai assisté, nous avons trouvé des gens, des, 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 des délégués de, des gouvernements les USA, d'Angleterre, de France et de Russie, acquis à la pertinence de la théorie de la dissuasion 
et nous accusant, accusant le pape François, pour, pour être précis, d'idéalisme et de naïveté. Alors, ma question, quel, quel chemin pour convertir les responsables et faire, les faire changer de, de mentalité Thank you. I, I, I missed that word to turn. Thank you very much. It's a, um, it's a complicated word in English too, and it's a complicated philosophy, but uh, the position that we hold is that uh, you're quite right, uh, Monsignor uh, Bishop, we do need to uh, convince people that this is a false narrative. This is a narrative that's been put forth by our military, uh, various militaries in the world for a long, long time. Uh, it, and again, this puts people in a false sense of complacency. It's not deterrence. And we can see in Ukraine right away that nuclear weapons that aren't even being used are already uh, uh, hurting us, uh, that we're so uh, uh, black, being blackmailed by them. Uh, the reality is that, uh, as, as Mr. Cogman points out in nukewatch.org, is that, uh, you know, if it was purely deterrence, you'd only need one or 200 uh, weapons uh, per country to, to accomplish that end. But even that is not helpful because the possibility of an accident, the possibility of a rogue bomb getting uh, a terrorist government or terrorists getting a hold of it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that inherently uh, atomic weapons are, are, are beyond our control, really. We, we like to think that we're in control. We like to think, oh, look what we've done. We have these weapons here now for deterrence. But no, we don't. What we've done is we've established a world that is completely unsafe. As McNamara said, uh, it's only by luck that we have avoided uh, catastrophic uh, death and destruction in our, in our world. So this whole philosophy of deterrence is simply not right. Now, clearly it's gonna take time. We, we have to move uh, to reducing our stockpiles and move to signing these treaties that we've been talking about in our meeting. And then the next step after that would be the, the complete abolition of nuclear weapons because we see that, and now they're so sophisticated and so powerful, uh, a bomb that Russia just recently came out with is 2,500 times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so I think we have to realize that this is a false narrative that's been presented to us. And we have to really uh, call, call, call it what it is and realize that there's no such thing as the only real deterrence is to get rid of all nuclear weapons, period. That's, that's true deterrence. But as long as we have nuclear weapons, we don't have deterrence. We just have a false sense of complacency. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, uh, thank you for very much for your pastor letter, uh, Archbishop. Um, uh, I, the most encouraging thing I saw and the thing that excited me most was your conclusion from scripture that there are no exceptions, there are no justifications for warfare and no just war theory in particular. Uh, I think those, those things are even more important than the discussion of the nuclear issue. Um, in your pastor letter, you advocated multilateral verifiable nuclear disarmament as our only hope. Couldn't we say though that truthfully that in Gethsemane, Jesus insisted that Peter disarm unilaterally in the face of an <clears throat> armed mob and a Roman cohort, which had come to take him to his death. Didn't Jesus surrender to his enemies in order to prevent further bloodshed? Governments may never disarm, but shouldn't Catholics and Christians be taught by their leaders that they must not have anything to do with nuclear weapons or militaries that refuse to take their use off the table as we do in the United States? And I just would add to that that I think the problem that we see in Ukraine, I think, is that uh, it's it's loyalty to nationalism, nationalism and uber nationalism that leads us to war, rather than our our mutual commitment to our baptismal promises in the Orthodox and in the Catholic Church as well. Thank you, Mark. Yes, I think that uh, you bring up a very good point. It's a very, uh, and this is what I. I'm hoping for uh, to help to encourage is this kind of conversation. I admit that personally, I have, I'm still struggling with these questions that you raised, but they're important questions and we have to struggle with them. 
Uh, I encourage, you know, Father John Deere, who is known to so many of you, especially just recently, those of you who are on this call on the Zoom from Scotland. Uh, Father John Deere has written extensively about this very issue of, of, of a, a nonviolent Jesus, of the gospel of nonviolence, and all that that means. Um, and so I think you make a very good point. I, I, I am not prepared personally to really address that issue of unilateral disarmament. I know it's, it's very, uh, a very complex one, but it's a challenging point that you bring up, Mark. And I think it's one that we need to address and we need to struggle with and to see uh, where that goes. I mean, I think if everybody, you know, theoretically was committed to nonviolence, uh, that this would have a ripple effect. I think we've seen uh, countries in World War II that, uh, that uh, really responded, and Father John Deere makes this point, they responded to the Nazi occupation, the Nazi war machine with really nonviolent non-cooperation. And they experienced less deaths and, and less killings, uh, say in the concentration camps than other countries. So I, I think it is a very important question that you raise. Um, I, I, as I say, I'm not prepared personally to say anything. Uh, I don't think that's, uh, I, 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 I defer to others who are more expert than I in this matter, but I thank you for raising that question. I think it's an important one. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Wester. And um, maybe I will bring you in contact with the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, Mark. So um, we we'll may be able to give you uh, an answer on your questions and uh, I will bring you in contact with them. I see that uh, a few uh, chats are being written quite a bit. Um, we, we maybe still have two or three minutes. Um, I see a few French ones and Spanish ones. Um, Céline, you, I saw you raise your hand. C'était pour lire la question de, du père euh, du Rwanda euh, sur le lien entre comment, pour construire la paix durable, il faut une éducation des enfants et des jeunes à la non-violence. Euh, comment faire pour introduire une ligne éducative non-violente dans les écoles pour préparer les nouvelles générations qui croient en la non-violence pour pouvoir bâtir des futurs états non-violents I think this is a question that also is dealt with within Pax Christi International itself and the project we are doing on training, trainings on nonviolence of young people. So uh, it's Abbé Théogène et à Karemia. Um, je vais vous mettre en contact avec notre coordinateur, uh, Dieudonné Seruka Bouza, uh, qui peut vous, um, qui fait vous donner un peu plus d'informations sur ce projet que nous avons. Merci de votre question. I see that Walter, Walter Pouzino from Pax Christi Puri raised his hand. It will be Spanish. Sí, muchas gracias. Sí, muy, muchas gracias. Las exposiciones que han sido muy valiosas y esclarecedoras. Eh, mi preocupación va en el sentido de lo que ninguna razón justifica el uso de las armas nucleares. Es una afirmación que estoy extrayendo de la exposición de lo que ustedes nos han eh, dado. Y eh, también en, la, en el sentido de la teoría de la disuasión. Eh, creo que es importante frenar el uso de las armas nucleares. Pero más importante es cómo trabajar por este mundo justo que también nos habló el Monseñor Wester. ¿Cómo hacer posible este trabajar? Por, porque justamente estamos en esa situación porque no hacemos quizás lo suficiente por trabajar ese mundo justo. ¿Y cómo trabajar ese mundo justo en un mundo contradictorio con nuevas tecnologías de la información y comunicación? Pero sin embargo estamos incomunicados y no sabemos a quién le asiste la razón. Por un lado, los, los, los hermanos de Ucrania y por el otro lado las personas que están en, en Rusia. Y hay muchas versiones que, 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 se, que circulan y que no sabemos realmente a quién le asiste la razón para construir justamente este mundo justo. Eh, yo creo que hay una tarea enorme que tenemos que seguir desarrollando. Por un lado, eh, frenar el uso de las armas nucleares. No hay justificación para su uso. 
pero por otro lado, trabajar por este mundo justo, por la cual nosotros pertenecemos a nuestro movimiento Paz Cristo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. Um, I don't think this is a specific question to, to anybody. I think we have to close down a little bit the, the, this question and answer as it's already 4.20 and we still have a session where we're going to look more at the action part. So um, I would suggest that we go to that part and therefore I would like to introduce Mr. Jonathan Felix who is the, um, our representative uh, for disarmament of Pax Christi International in Geneva, and also humanitarian disarmament consultant for the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs of the World Council of Churches. So, um, Jonathan, I will give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to sit here and to listen to everybody, and a real blessing to be with you. Um, I think we might just think for a minute of the many, many wonderful Zooms and webinars we've been to during the pandemic. Um, and if you're a bit like me, perhaps there have been a couple where you, we weren't able to do anything about what we're talking about right on the spot when we're motivated and inspired by what we've heard. Well, in this particular webinar, we're not gonna solve some of the big problems you've talked about, but we're proposing two actions which relate exactly to what we've been talking about in this webinar, in this context right now, and with the coming six weeks until the first meeting of the new treaty to ban nuclear weapons. So I'd like to call up some slides. And Cecile, should I call them up by sharing my screen or are you going to uh, show them? So the first slide is introducing the action section, which relates exactly to our topic, and it's doable with a few clicks. So if we bring up this main screen, the first screen, um, backing up, backing up a little, one more. Okay, that's the first screen. And then let, let's just look at this map for a minute and understand some of the power we have in Pax Christi International. If you can make it full screen on the, there we go. Um, this is a map of the nuclear weapon ban treaty. So the light blue, sta light blue states are the states that have signed. There are 60 states that have signed, all right? The dark blue states are the states that are actually parties. That means they've not only signed, but they've ratified. I, I should get myself straight here. 86 countries have signed, 60 have ratified. All right, so there are 60 dark blue states and 86 light when you count both blues. Now, if you look at the rest of the map, you see all the yellow is countries with Pax Christi International members. And the green wins the prize for this afternoon session because they're Pax Christi international members in countries that have signed or become a state party of the nuclear ban treaty. So you see the potential we have to make a bit of a difference here in the process of this treaty right next door to where the terrible war in Ukraine is happening. In Vienna, at the end of June, Countries of the world will come together for the first working meeting of the new treaty that came into force last year, which makes nuclear weapons illegal. And we're gonna talk about an action right now that can happen starting right now during the webinar and another one uh, in, the, in the coming days. So the next slide, please. Uh, there was some, uh, yeah, okay. We should just back up to the, the percentage. There we go. To summarize what you saw on the map, 44% of UN member states have signed the, the uh, nuclear ban treaty. 31%, a third have ratified it. And this is in, in only the, few, the short time it's been open. It's on record speed to become a global treaty and, and cover more and more of the world. 
And then 31% of the UN member states have Pax Christi members. So we're in a good position to influence the course of this treaty. Next slide. After the map, there we go. Two actions, one right now, it'll start right now during the session. It's a joint appeal. And in the uh, hours and days that follow the, the uh, webinar, you'll be able to follow it up with a direct national letter. The joint appeal asks, it's called a joint appeal to 60 governments. And our plan is to send it signed by everybody on this webinar. So that's about 100 people. And there are some others who didn't show up. They could sign it too. And it'll be open for other signatures. And this will go to the government of every country, the 60 countries where Pax Christi has member organizations. They'll all get the joint appeal, which you'll have access to right now by uh, uh, the connections we have. And it'll be mailed to you, I believe, at the same time. We invite you to just sign it. It's a Google form. You'll get a template, sign it, and your name will be with all the other 100 people on this uh, call who send it to, who will, who will go together as it goes to all the countries where Pax Christi has members. The second action is to follow that up with your own government. So there's another letter waiting for you. And all it will take is for you to fill in your name and your address and your and your a, few, a couple of very small details and send it directly to your government and say you've just received the joint appeal from Pax Christi International, a joint appeal to 60 governments. We want you to go to the first meeting of states parties in Vienna at the end of June. And for small countries without big foreign affairs budgets, the United Nations provides support to get people there. And this is a critical point for us because the world as a whole is opposed to nuclear weapons. 132 countries negotiated this treaty, 132, that's two thirds of the countries. Uh, 160 countries have signed statements saying nuclear weapons must never be used again. It is in the interest of the very survival of humanity. There are huge global majorities at the level of the United Nations General Assembly against nuclear weapons. As a worldwide organization, Pax Christi International can help to mobilize that support and do one specific action from this webinar relating to the next thing on the anti-nuclear agenda, which is the meeting of the state's party that makes this weapon illegal. So we really invite your uh, participation. We'll switch to the last, uh, the last slide here. Cecile, are we uh, still in, on board? I think the last one is your contacts. So summarizing what we've talked about, encouraging faith leaders to support the treaty. Urge your government to attend the first meeting of states parties. And then invite your faith community to ask your government to support the treaty. You will have already done so after you access that Google form and put your name on it. But then follow it up with your own government using that direct national letter which follows. And if you're really ambitious, go ask for a meeting with your foreign ministry. Um, ask for a meeting with the people that, that are bound, duty bound to receive public, uh, serious public visits and, and make the same witness in person. And, and this is a chance to convert all of our outrage and our inspiration from the wonderful speakers we've had um, to move forward here, the voices we've had to reach out and mobilize the other countries that are on the list who are not from nuclear weapon states, but to mobilize ourselves also in the nuclear weapon states and to take a, a specific action which relates exactly to what's happening the 21st of June in Vienna when the first meeting of this state's party, this uh, treaty for the banning of nuclear weapons takes place. I hope that's clear. Um, 
and we'll be in touch with you by the mailing list for the meeting. And we're able to translate together some of the um, concern we have into a small concrete step somewhere along the, the wonderful path that is waiting for us to walk towards that nuclear weapon free world. Thank you to each one of you for taking part in this way, as well as for being on the webinar. Jonathan, thank you very much. And meanwhile, I see that we have put the link to the Google Doc in the chat. So when you click on it, you can already start uh, signing it. You will also receive after this email, all of you have registered, will receive a, a mail from us where we put a link again to this Google Doc and where we will put also um, a link to a template letter that you can use in order to write to your own governments. So we hope to do that after this webinar or in, in, the, coming, or in the coming days. Uh, but we hope that uh, at least uh, you could sign the Google Doc by, by the Sunday, by the Sunday evening. That would be wonderful as we will be sending it out to the, the foreign agencies, the foreign uh, ministries in, in the countries that Jonathan was mentioning. So thank you very much for this very concrete action that we can do, Jonathan. So, um, so th this time, I think we are, um, if I'm not mistaken, we're coming almost to the end of, of the webinar. And uh, I would like to um, invite Sister Wamuyu to uh, lead us in a prayer for reflection to close, uh, to close this webinar. I'm sorry that my camera is no longer there, but um, um, I'm with you as you hear. Um, thank you all. Thank you all to the speakers. To thank you. And um, so I hope to. We, I hope that um, we can all work towards a better world. So I don't think we should lose hope. We we such webinars as today should be very encouraging for us. I think so. Sister Wamuyu, may I invite you to close the session with a prayer? Thank you, Brett. So let's pray. God who loves all people equally, thank you for our great speakers today. We gathered here from all the different parts of the world. We gathered here to appeal and plead with leaders of our world to participate in creating a world free of nuclear weapons and any weapons that destroys the way of life they claim to protect. We gathered here as a visible reminder that nuclear weapons have no place in our world or are no part of the approaches to peace building or building a culture of peace. We gathered here to commit once more to nonviolent way of living and knowing and believing that nuclear weapons have never and will never create a peaceful world. Loving God, you came that all may have life and have it more abundantly. We intercede especially for Ukraine that this will be their reality. As we conclude our time together, we ask you to journey with us so that we may follow in your footsteps that we may preach and live nonviolent ways. Call us and our governments beyond the lukewarmness as far as free nuclear weapons world is concerned. Give us courage to challenge traditions that enhance violence or war as a means to address and create peace. May we speak truth without fear. Walk the nonviolent path, even if it leads us to the cross. May we be a people of hope, especially among those that suffer as a result of the different forms of violence in our world. 
Come, our God of peace. Come, our risen Lord. Renew the face of our world. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Bamuyu. And goodbye to everybody. Thank you for your participation. Thank and you. Hopefully next time. And hopefully Merci you will beaucoup. sign our petition. Bye bye. Merci. Bye. Okay. Au revoir. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Au revoir, merci. Thank you all.